First, a true story. A man in Buenos Aires, Argentina, wanted to get a bunion removed. He was full of fears, so he requested a general anaesthetic. Result, a heart attack. They cut open his chest, cut down both sides of his heart, put him in an oxygen tent, and here his stomach gave an unwanted contraction, and the result was peritonitis. So they took him out of the oxygen tent and put him on a stretcher, but he fell off, and he broke a leg and a collarbone. Then he had another heart attack. So this time they gave him a tracheotomy and put a tube into his throat. When that poor man left hospital, he still had his bunion. <laughs> but he had his leg in a cast, his arm in a sling, a drainage tube from his stomach and a breathing tube from his throat. Now that is a true story. Its full meaning will only be apparent in the next half hour. He must never get down in the mouth. You remember Jonah was there and he came out all right. And you should also remember that every day the most powerful thing in the universe has a think sinking spell and goes out of sight for hours into darkness and then comes up the next day bright as a new penny Depression is a problem for all of us at times. Charles Spurgeon, the greatest preacher since Paul, was beside by it with great regularity, with no reason except that he worked much too hard and he's under too much stress and too much strain. Abraham Lincoln similarly battled with depression all the years he was in the White House. Probably similar reasons, but no doubt some reasons are physiological as well as psychological. I want to tell you some things that uh, Spurgeon mentioned in a lecture on fainting fits, depression, when life is too much for us. He began by saying that David, in the heat of conflict, according to the King James Version, waxed faint. Now I'm going to be quoting Spurgeon from here on. All of us are made of dust. A few short years, we'll be back to dust. Some of us sooner than others, but we're all going back to dust. And meantime, we're promised immunity from guilt, but not from trouble. Our Lord promised the disciples three things. They'd be always in trouble. They would always be uproariously happy. And they would never be without help. Even the brave are not always courageous. Even the wise are not always sane. Even the joyous are not always happy. An old song says, sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Yea, Lord. Because we're tied to flesh, we're not pure spirit. Pretty well all of us have some physical infirmities and often also some mental infirmities. Aristotle said we are all a little bit lunatic Mental work is very tiring and in our civilization, physical work is just about done. Machines are doing it and mental work takes its place and too much mental work can lead to depression. Often we sit in a room that's not well ventilated. Spurgeon said we're pushing a pen but today we say we're sitting at a computer with muscles that haven't been tired by exercise and a heart that's often weighed down with perplexities. And we ignore the fact that just outside the window 
nature is calling us to health and beckoning us to joy. But if we no longer hear the birds or the rill of the waters and we're not singing ourselves, depression is inevitable. It happened to David. It happened to Elijah. How did the Lord treat Elijah? Well, gave him a good sleep, rest. Gave him nourishing food. Then he told him something. He caused a great fire, a great earthquake, tremendous happenings. But God was not in any of them. And then a still small voice, the voice of God. And God was saying to Elijah, you've had a lot of excitement, but it's the gentle voice of the Holy Spirit that gets most done. Don't think you're great because you won over the prophets of Baal. The issue is, are you listening to the still, small voice of the Spirit? You remember Jacob on one occasion said, all these things are against me. When Pharaoh asked him about his journey through life, he said, few and evil days. And his son was about to ransom the world, save it from starvation by the bread of life. But all he could say was, all these things are against me. We are so inclined to look at the negative side. We are so inclined to see the cloud instead of the blue sky. Our Lord had the right therapy. He said to his disciples on one occasion, come ye yourselves apart and rest a while. Now think of the situation. People were dying. People were bewildered. Scribes and Pharisees were like wolves attacking these poor people. And Jesus takes off for a holiday. A red-hot fanatic would have said, how dare you do that? Look at the pressing need. But Jesus knew better than to exhaust his disciples. And you and I will never be able to work like Christ unless we learn to rest like Christ. In a storm in the boat on Galilee, what's he doing? Sleeping. We'll never work like Christ till we learn to rest like Christ. Even earth has its holidays. Winter months enjoys its Sabbaths. Every day has its closing time. God pulls the shades. And human beings who are tied to flesh are so foolish to think they can work like the angels without pause. You cannot do it and get away with it. A breakdown is inevitable, preceded by fits of depression. Now Spurgeon didn't say this, but I'll throw it in at this point. The World Health Organisation says by 2020... Depression will be the main cause of death in the West. It is a very, very serious problem. There is a test whereby you and I can know whether we're heading for a crack-up. There's a very simple test you can take in a few minutes that will answer the question... Am I losing vitality so I can't cope with life? Am I soon going to be down and out? You know what an ammeter is. An ammeter registers whether electrical power is being stored up or whether it's being dissipated. So here is the ammeter test. I'm going to mention seven things. And if you suffer from these seven things constantly, most of them in a cluster you are in trouble. The items one by one mean nothing. We all suffer from some of these. But when you have them all in the cluster, you are in trouble. So here they are. Number one, the beginning of our ammeter test. Irritability without known cause. When every day seems to have a thousand traps, when your family seems to be avoiding you, when you lose your cool over trifles, that's number one. Irritability 
without known cause. Second, loss of power of concentration. If you no longer want to read a heavy book <coughs> or a difficult article, if it's tiring when you're forced to do so, lack of concentration. Third one, and this pricks my conscience, losing memory for names. It's perfectly natural to forget some names, but when you are tired out, it comes over you like a flood and most well-known names are gone. Next one, indigestion. If you've got a healthy stomach, you don't know it's there. If you know you've got a stomach, there's something wrong. If everything you eat seems a threat, if you have recurring indigestion, that is the next point. Headaches. Headaches mainly come from emotional strain and all of us have them occasionally. But if you get them often, there's something wrong in the way you're living. Only one in a thousand is a brain tumour or something like that. It's the way you're living. Fatigue. If you're tired without known reason, you need to examine your lifestyle. Physical toil builds up lactic acid and makes us tired. But most people don't suffer from that today. We're a sedentary race now. Our ancestors worked 12 hours in the field every day. And we live under electric light with a computer or something similar for about eight hours a day, which is quite suicidal. Fatigue is inevitably the result of frustration or unhappy personal interactions. And then finally, mild depression. I say mild depression because some types of depression are chemically induced and it may take an endocrinologist to find out what hormones or something else is missing. But most mild depression is not that at all. It's just you tuck it out. Tuck it out. Right, there's the problem. <clears throat> what is God's solution? I quote to you from the great book of wisdom, Proverbs. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 23.7. As a person thinks in his heart, so is he. Thinking is not just psychological, it is physiological. Why do we cry? We mainly cry because of something going on up here. Upset, tragedy, concern. Thinking causes tears. Thinking causes sweat when we're afraid. It's dark and you're out in the woods and you hear noises you don't like, you begin to sweat. Thinking, thinking does it. The night's not warm at all. A white face when you get a shock. What does it? Thinking does it. A racing heart, if you think you've seen a ghost. It's really the thinking that does it. The pant of passion. The sob of fear. These are all physiological results of thinking. Thinking influences every cell of the body and every moment of time. If you get upset, behind the cerebrum is what we call the hypothalamus. It begins to secrete and it first of all affects the pituitary, which governs all the endocrine glands, which pour out the hormones that we need. No more than a teaspoon a day for any of us, but we need it. Into the blood. And then we're different people with those hormones. But it began with thinking. As a man thinketh, keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. The two most important things in the universe for every one of us here is are what we love and what we fear. What we love and what we fear. 
The man with the bunion was so afraid he triggered all these other problems. But you know, excessive love of the wrong thing can do it too. I wonder if you've ever read the love letter to a cigarette. It goes like this. You are nearer to me than any human being, reposing in my pocket by my heart. With my lips I caress you more than any members of the family. When I awake, I immediately think of you and so throughout the whole day. I worship as your shrine with burnt offerings from the moment I wake to the moment I fall asleep. On your altar, there are always fires burning. Then the letter goes on like this. I pay more for you than I pay for religion or charities. I risk my life for you. I have one chance in eight of getting lung cancer and I double the likelihood of getting heart disease. I scatter your incense fumes to everybody that I meet. The marks of your governing, government of my body are visible on my fingertips, my whole body. And when I sweat, the effluvia is so terrible, people hold their nose and walk away. But I am making a discovery. The discovery is this, that I am a slave. I'm not really a smoker. I suck at one end and you smoke at the other. I am a sucker. If we love the wrong things, if we fear the wrong things, we invite depression and breakdown. Worry, something we all know about, and worry is just a form of fear. Worry is fear about tomorrow. The man with the bunion problem suddenly found his universe collapsing without warning. And most of our big problems come from an unclouded sky. Suddenly, car accident, news of a death, a doctor's verdict, which suggests that 99% of the things that we worry about never happen. The biggies come without warning. Christians sometimes feel very guilty when they worry because scripture says, he that feareth is not made perfect in love for perfect love casts out fear. But there's a positive aspect about worry. We have an infinite capacity for it and rightly used, it tells us about the seriousness of life and its gravity. A businessman who never worries about his business soon won't have a business to worry about. And if in World War II we learnt that the politicians weren't at all worried about the war, we'd want to sack them. Worry has its place, but we give it an exaggerated place. We turn little molehills into mountains. You know quite well that to sit upon a tack is much more painful than to sit upon a mountain. But that's what we do mentally. The molehills, the tacks, the things that aren't going to happen. Statistically, the odds are against them, 99 to 1. But we fear. We fear. And most of our fear is about tomorrow. You may have heard of William Osler. He was the greatest doctor America knew for over a century. <coughs> His life was changed by about a score of words from the English philosopher Thomas Carlyle, who said, our main business is not to try and discern what lies ahead in the distance, but to do what lies immediately at hand. And Osler chewed on that. And he was travelling the Atlantic, and he was up on the bridge with the captain. He noticed the captain pressed a button. He said, what's that for? He said, that makes watertight compartments. When I press this button... That shuts the compartments in the front 
the aft of the ship. And I pressed that one, the others are shut. And Osla thought, that's just what we should do with time. We should live in daytight compartments. So years later, when he was invited to speak at Yale and to trainee doctors, he said, listen, the burden of tomorrow added to the burden of today is too much for any of us to carry. We are to follow the example and teachings of Christ who said sufficient unto the day is the evil of that day. Be the day weary or be the day long, at length it ringeth to even song. Anyone can carry their burden, however heavy, till evening, and that's all God asks. That's all God ever asks. Would you look with me at Matthew 6? I want you to notice how Christ gives considerable attention to this exaggerated fear that we call worry. And we're looking at verse 25 onward. And as I read these verses, notice he will say, worry is needless. Then he'll say, worry is senseless. When he, when he says you can't add a cubit to your height by worrying, he's saying it's useless. Then he'll say it's faithless. And then he'll say the heathen worry like that. So it's pagan. Notice what he said. Needless, senseless, useless, non-Christian, faithless, pagan. Look at it. 25 onward of chapter 6. <clears throat> Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, how they sow or reap. They sow not, nor do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Which of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his glory was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? The pagans run after all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. The day has enough troubles of its own. I think you've probably heard of John Henry Newman, a very great man of the 19th century, though he lost his way theologically, but a great man. And one time of great perplexity, he wrote the hymn, Lead Kindly Light. Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark and I'm far from home. Lead thou me on, keep thou my feet. I do not ask to know the way. One step is enough for me. Lead kindly light. In 1945, March, Robert Moore was in the most difficult position he'd ever been in. He wrote about it later. He was 276 feet beneath the surface of the ocean. And depth charges were being dropped on his submarine for 15 hours. He said those 15 hours were like 15 million years. And I reviewed all my life, all the bad things I'd done, all the silly things I'd done. But most of all, I thought about all the stupid worries I had entertained. I had worried because I didn't have a big enough income. Couldn't buy my wife a new dress every few months. I worried because I couldn't afford a new car. I worried because I hated my boss. 
And he gives a whole list of the things that worried him. I used to quarrel with my wife over trifles, but now the depth charges are falling. 15 hours, and I'm about to be blown into kingdom come, and I think of the trifles I've worried about. And I resolve that if I ever get out of this, if ever I see sun and stars and moon again, I'll never worry about anything. He said, I learnt more in those 15 hours about living than in the four years at Syracuse University from books. At Longs Peak, Colorado, for 400 years there was a giant tree. It had survived earthquakes, avalanches, storms, year after year, century after century, and suddenly it went down. Why? Well, a colony of beetles came. And the beetles ate through the ark and then they ate through the strength of the giant tree and down it came. Beetles. Storms couldn't do it. Avalanches couldn't do it. Lightning couldn't do it. But beetles did it. And it's the beetles that often get you and me down. The molehills. The tax on which we sit. In the sight of heaven there are only beetles. And if we learn to count them as beetles, we can survive them. You know, the elephant in South Africa is immune to lions and tigers. But jungle ants creeping into the trunk can send it crazy. Ants destroying elephants. Yes, trifles destroy us. Have you ever thought about it? Human beings have more wretchedness than all the animal creation combined. Does your cat or dog get ulcers from worrying? You ever see horses so perplexed they just neigh all night? Human beings are more wretched than the whole animal creation put together because we are stupid in our thinking. Napoleon Bonaparte, some think he was the greatest of military men. I don't think so myself because he had no compassion. He had no heart. He said, I've only had six happy days in my life. Of course, he was the fault at fault. Not the world, not his neighbours. Napoleon Bonaparte was the cause of Napoleon Bonaparte's miserable life. Always wanted more. Helen Keller, born blind and deaf or within a couple of years of life, blind and deaf, she said at the end of her life, I have found life so beautiful. You know, when she was growing up, about eight or nine, parents couldn't manage her. She was tempestuous. She was wild. She was mad. She would break things, lock her mother in a room send a father up on the roof to look for something that wasn't there and then take away the ladder. So they sent for Anne Sullivan, who'd been blind, but now had almost normal sight. And Anne Sullivan tries to teach her. But Helen won't learn. One day she tears her rag doll to smithereens, stamps out of the house and follows her. And they're passing a, a water pump and Anne takes the child's hand, puts it under the pump and pumps it and the water comes down. As the water comes down on the child's hand, she spells out the equivalent of her method of teaching, W-A-T-E-R. And suddenly the child, for the first time in her life, learns that everything has a name and therefore everything should be loved. Changed her life. Went back into the house and tried to put the rag doll together. Spent a life helping people. I think she was the first woman in America to gain a degree, though she was blind. Wrote books, travelled south, north, east and west. I have found life so beautiful. You may have heard of the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. I remember hearing about this back in the 1940s when one of my relatives used to quote it. Lord... Give me the serenity 
to accept all the things I can't change. Give me the courage to change the things that I can change and give me the wisdom to know the difference. Give me the serenity to accept what I cannot change. The courage to change what I can and the wisdom to know the difference. You've all heard of Chuck Swindoll, a very great Christian. He was a Marine in World War II, became a Christian and he's probably the next to Billy Graham in the modern world of Christianity. Chuck Swindoll some years ago said something like this. The older I grow the more important I realise is attitude. More important than facts, money, education, giftedness, beauty or being handsome. More important than people or events, attitude. You know, you can't change the past. You can't change people. You can't change the inevitable. But there's one thing you can change. That's your attitude. Life is 10% what happens to me. And 90% what I do about it, my attitude, attitude. This, of course, is just an expansion of what Proverbs is saying. Out of the heart are the issues of life. As a person thinks in his heart, so is he. The greatest lesson that I have to learn and that you have to learn is to refuse to let negative thoughts come in here just as much as you wouldn't allow a burglar to set up house in your home. You will be tormented and tempted by negative thoughts all your days. The only real remedy is to believe that God loves you as though you were the only person in the world to be loved. Have you got that? If you believe that God loves you as though you were the only person in the world to be loved and that nothing can hurt you in the long run. Believe that the Father's presence surrounded Christ. Nothing entered his life except by divine permission. That was his assurance and that's for us. The person who believes in Christ abides in Christ and whatever comes to him or her comes from the Saviour who surrounds him or her. All our sufferings and sorrows, all our trials and temptations, all our sadness and griefs, all our persecution and privations, in short, all things work together for our good. All experiences... All circumstances are God's workmen whereby good is brought to us. Romans 8, 28 to 39 says that over and over. If God be for us, what can be against us? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither life nor death, nor things present nor things to come, nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. We must believe what the gospel is trying to tell us. And as we believe, we will learn to obey. <clears throat> our Lord Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He was quoting Old Testament there. New Testament's against law as a method. We're not under law as a covenant. We're only under grace. But law remains a standard of holiness and Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Never forget those three Pauline texts. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But faith that works by love. That's everything. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But a new creature. That's everything. And the last one, I've been quoting Galatians, Last one, 1 Corinthians 7, 19. Not so popular to many modern Christians, but it comes from the same man, inspired by the same spirit. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But the keeping of the commandments of God is everything. Not to be saved. Too late for that. Sin means death. As soon as my conscience operated, I violated it. 
But if you love me, keep my commandments. How we wish God would tell us how to live. You know, there was a famous man who kept a folder, F T I H D. Fill these things I have done. Now, I would need more than a filing cabinet. I would need a whole room. If only God would tell us. Well, he has. Why didn't he come down in a couple of minutes, sum it up, how to live, what not to do, what to do, so he could have untrammeled joy? He did. He did. And it was all about love. When Jesus summarised the law from Sinai, he summarised it by one word, love. Then he expanded it. Love God with all you've got. Love your neighbour as yourself. People say, hey, them old Ten Commandments can't save me. Why bother about them? Listen, he was telling people how to live. He was saying life isn't casual, life is causal. And he was saying people are more important than things. You know where things come in the Decalogue? Last. Thou shalt not covet anything. You know, some fathers spend more time cleaning their shoes than time with their children. They make things more important than people. That invites tragedy. So God did tell us how to live. Life is not casual, it's causal. Be careful what you do. Life has its gravity. Life has its sacredness. Follow the way of love that reflects me. Then you'll have happiness. Then you'll avoid tragedy. And the third thing he taught on how to live was give God his place. So the first four commandments were about God. Worship only him. No idols. Don't profane his name. Don't profane his day. Give God his place. Seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. He was really telling us the 80-20 principle. It's very important to understand that 80% of our lives only has 20% of importance. 20% of our lives has 80% of importance. You must know what's in the 20%. Your relationship to God. Your relationship to your health. Your relationship to your family. That's the 20%. Everything else is in the 80%. When we learn that, we remember the words of Christ to, to Martha. Martha, you're careful and anxious about many things, but only one thing is needful. Here she was preparing a 10-course meal for the 12 disciples. Jesus says, look, just put on apples. You're careful and anxious about many things. Only one thing is necessary. Don't be cumbered with much serving. But you see, it's all about love. He loves us. Christ can say to the disciples, come and rest a while. It's more important to him that they not lose their vitality than that he meet some immediate tragedy nearby. It was love. It was love. And we have to learn to love like that. You know, the spokes for wheel get closer to each other when? When they're near the hub. Here's life in a nutshell. Life is a triangle. I have a relationship to God. If I know he accepts me, I can accept myself. If I don't know he accepts me, I'll never know I can accept myself. But if he accepts me, I can accept myself. And only when I can accept myself, I can accept people. Sartre said, hell is other people. He didn't know about God. And he should have added, heaven is other people. But as the spokes get closer to each other, as we get nearer to the hub, so as we get nearer to God, we get nearer to people to do what we can for them. Remembering the triangle, that only as I'm assured that God accepts me can I accept myself. Then I can accept others. Would you look with me at 2 Corinthians 12, please? <clears throat> Paul is the greatest man who ever lived next to the God-man. But boy, did he have troubles. 
Well, I'm looking at 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. The earlier verses before that talk about his being taken up to heaven, seeing visions of heaven, third heaven, wonderful. But then it says, to keep me from being conceited, verse 7, because of these surpassingly great revelations, there has given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord, take it away from me. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Hey, God said no to Paul, the greatest man on earth. God said no. I thought we were meant to pray when we had a need. Yes, we are. And when we get to heaven, we'll thank God more for the times he said no. I always laugh at Walter Martin, the Bible answer man is now dead. I knew him, walked with him, dined with him, visited him in hospital. But the best thing that Walter Martin ever told me was this, that when he was very young, he fell in love with a beautiful looking woman. The best looking woman since Eve. Oh, he said, I hammered on heaven's door. Get her for me. She pleases me well. And God said, no. Walter said, years later I met her. And then I looked up to heaven and I said, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you, God. So here's Paul, the greatest man on earth, and God says to him, no. And he's got a thorn in the flesh. You know, we can sympathise with other people's thorn in the flesh, but my thorn in the flesh, that's different. So God, get rid of it. And he says to me, my grace is sufficient for thee. There isn't anybody here that doesn't have a thorn in the flesh. Spurgeon was right. We all have infirmities of body and mind. I had an accident in Russia years ago, affected an organ of my body that won't be cured to glorification. We all have infirmities. We all have them. But God says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect and weakness. And then he goes on to say, and this is where he's so different to me, therefore I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. I just keep praying. But he says, no, okay, Lord, okay. So that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships. When I'm weak, then am I strong. Would you look with me at Philippians 4? This is one of the greatest passages in the Bible. And when you're tempted to depression, you need to say this to yourself over and over again. Look please, verse 4 onwards. Rejoice in the Lord occasionally when you feel like it, when the going's good. No, no. Rejoice in the Lord always. Notice it doesn't say circumstances, it doesn't say people, it doesn't say yourself. It says rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice, because none of us obey, you see. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What is he saying? He is saying, and I would God, that he would enable me to obey him in this every day in my life. I have many failures. But here's what it's saying. Be anxious about nothing. Be prayerful about everything. Be thankful for anything. Listen, the devil can never get victory over a person who is full of gratitude and praise. Will you think on that? The devil can never get victory over anyone that is full of gratitude and praise. Therefore, be anxious, worry about nothing except your duty. Pray about everything. Be thankful for anything. I think that probably most of you have never heard of rhinocopia. Time magazine, August 
2010, had on his cover a beautiful girl, but she looked horrible. She had two holes in the center of her face because of rhinocopia. What is that? For thousands of years, cruel nations have cut off the tip of the nose of enemies. It was done to Justinian II. They did it in India. They still do it in a number of countries. They cut off the tip of the nose. So as you look at the face, it is horrible. You see two holes in the centre. Because this will now affect every conscious hour of your life. I complained because I had no shoes. So I met a man who had no feet. When we lose things, we all should always ask, what's left? And what would I give for what's left? How much would I take for my family, my ability to see, hear, speak, walk? How much would I take? Count your blessings. Be grateful for everything. You know, when I was a young lad in my teens, I was reading a book by William Paley, Natural Theology. He said the big things in life is able to use your faculties, physical and mental, to have food to eat, friends to love. These are the big things. And he's right. You and I fall into the gap of humanity in being ambitious about things that could destroy us. We should only be ambitious to be what God wants us to be. That's enough. And so we are to practice the presence of God and believe his promises. Do you know what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says? If you don't know, shame on you. And shame on me, because I looked it up to be certain. First Corinthians 10, 13 says, There's been no trial taken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. He won't permit you to be tried above that you are able, but will with the trial make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Isn't that a great promise? Isn't that a great promise? No trial taken you, but such is common to man. KJV says temptation. The Greek word pyrasmos means any test, any trial. God is faithful. I'm often not faithful, but God is faithful. Won't suffer you to be tried above that you're able. Will with the trial make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So the remedy for our fainting fits, and we all have them. Believe in God's love. When we really believe God loves us, means to do us good, we'll trust God as a child trusts a loving parent. Our ills and torments will disappear because our will is swallowed up in the will of God. When we really believe God loves us as though there's no one else to love. When we really believe that. Then we'll believe his promises. Read off in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Shadows can't hurt. For thou art with me. I said to a friend recently, may the Lord be always at your pillow. He is. The Lord's always at our pillow. We should often read Psalm 23. Psalm 37, the Lord is my light and salvation. Of whom should I be afraid? Read Psalm 139. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. If I should count them, they're more in number than the sands of the sea. Hey, do you believe that? God's thoughts about you are more numerous than the number of the sands of the grains of the sea. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. Psalm 139. And one of my favourites, Psalm 142, and I'll bet you don't know it, but you ought to look at it and read it. It's a favourite for me. This passage in Philippians should not cease where I stopped because it goes on to say this in Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, my brethren, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, 
If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Remember, what you think about here affects every cell of your body, every moment of time. And God forbids us to be negative in our thinking. He forbids us to worry about things that are senseless, needless, useless, faithless and pagan. Most of all, he forbids us to worry about tomorrow. But he commands us to learn to love. Only a life that has a surplus of love can handle the strains, the tests, the ups and downs of existence. A simpleton can follow a well-lit path, but a true believer can walk in the darkness with great accuracy if their hand is in the hand of the great guide. Our biggest problem, mine and yours, is we don't believe fully enough in the love of God for us. We need to ask him to make us sure. Then there'll be no strain in loving him. You see, there's an old hymn, trust and obey, no other way, be happy in Jesus and to trust and obey. That's excellent, but it's not enough because I often find it hard to trust. And I can only get over that barrier when I think on the love of God, when I think on Calvary, when I think on Christ. Only then does it become easy to trust and obey. Alas, and did my Saviour bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Did he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I have done he groaned upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, love beyond degree. Well might the sun in darkness hide, shut its glories in, when Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. So might I hide my blushing face when e'er thy cross appears. Dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt my eyes to tears. But drops of grief are near enough to pay the debt I owe. Lord, I give myself away. That's all that I can do. Let's pray. Lord, life is tough, but you've told us how to meet it, to believe in your love, believe in your promises, to follow the way of love shown by your commandments of love. Give it to us to trust and to believe, to think only on the things that are pure and true and good, on Calvary, on Christ and the gospel. Do it for each of us, we pray. Amen.